Hi, my name is Dima, and I just finished my fourth year at Imperial College London. I just graduated with an MN in computer science, and this project is part of my final, final year work that apparently got me a couple of awards this morning. So this project is all about privacy, connecting privacy preservation and connecting machine learning. The underlying issue is that the current ways of conducting collaborative machine learning is flawed. We tend to disclose too much information and violate things such as GDPR or HIPAA in two different ways. The first one being sharing the data directly, which is a big no-no, we should never do that. And the second issue is that the models that we use in collaborative learning tend to remember too much about each individual participant, potentially uh, resulting in, in leakages of features or even individual training images later as we continue with the training process. How bad can it possibly be? Well, this slide tells you quite a bit about it. So this, this is an example of an AT&T data set, which is a data set full of facial images, as you can see, and an attacker that doesn't even perform in the training process. So they can only observe partial updates. They could uh, observe how the clients are behaving in the federation, can capture those updates and use them to recreate almost identical images to the ones that were used to train the model. As you can see, this is pretty problematic in, in the case of image machine learning, especially when we talk about sensitive medical data. So what is the underlying design issue of collaborative machine learning that allows this to happen? Well. The, the list of requirements, which is pretty long, and the two main points there are that the, firstly, the data stays private, and secondly, that the accuracy of the model is well maintained, doesn't necessarily meet the reality where when we try to allow for higher accuracy, we could potentially result in uh, leakages of data, making it less private. And when we try to go for more privacy, we could result in the loss of utility for the Federation. And the basic idea of this slide is that there is a large number of factors that people want to see, and then there is a large number of factors that contribute towards them not seeing it. And those lists are very often disjoined. So the original approach that was used to train a collaborative machine learning model was centralized, where the data is sent one way, aggregated on the server, and the task is performed there. As we've just discussed, it is not a good idea because the data should always stay uh, on the client's original machine. As a result, we turn to alternatives, the best one of which is federated learning, where the central server is selected, it sends out the global model, the model is trained locally on each individual client so that the data is never shared. And in order to perform extra privacy preservation, we even apply secure aggregation where once they compute the updates, they send it back to the server, but they are aggregated so that it is not possible to determine where the update is coming from. And as we see in a minute, this is actually very useful when, uh, when we discuss privacy preservation during reconstruction attacks. So the attacks that we implemented uh, were based on reconstruction and inference. And in this presentation, we talk about reconstruction as they tend to be a lot more destructive than the inference attacks. The first one is the one that we designed ourselves. It's called generative decoder. So if you're familiar with the idea of data encoding, you take data of large dimensions, you try to squeeze it into some intermediate representation and expand it back into a more efficient format. Well, this is exactly what happens in this attack where the encoder is the target model that does proper medical training and the decoder is the adversary that tries to determine what training data was used by trying to expand it back to what it originally was. This attack works really well because it has a large number of entry points it has uh, many different potential scenarios for simple data sets, and it performs really well on accurate models. And by accurate models, I mean models of accuracy of about 60%, as we discuss discovered experimentally. As you see from this slide, for simple data sets, such as handwritten digits of MNIST, or for small pictures of CIFAR-10, we obtain pretty accurate images uh, in comparison to which ones were used for training. Again, as you can see from this slide, there is a common trend for most attacks is that the dimension of data directly contributes to the effectiveness of the attack. And the larger the dimension is, the worse the result of the attack is. Now we see that it's possible to obtain something similar, but not quite identical to the training images. We look into the attack that's called deep leakage from gradients. And the idea behind the attack is pretty simple. Each normal participant generates an update on the image that they train the model with. And this update is captured by the attacker. And they try to perturb the random combination of pixels that they have from the attacker side to match this update. The main feature or bug of this attack, if you want, is that there is no partial reconstruction. As we've seen here, you could obtain something that looks similar enough. In some cases, they fail to produce accurate enough images, but 
something midway is completed anyway. For this attack, you either get the exact training image or you get nothing. This slide just shows you how well it performs. Uh, bear in mind that 100 iterations takes about a minute. So this is, this, is the num this is the amount of time that you actually need to wait to obtain good results for Safar 100, which is similar to Safar 10. Uh, it's low dimensional images, they're colored. It's pretty easy to, to be scared after seeing this. However, as we also um, discuss from the results that we obtain in our experiments, it doesn't really scale well for large images. So this data set is called 4P, or Private Pediatric Pneumonia Prediction. It's uh, pretty large. The dimensions are 2.5 thousand by 1.4 thousand. And those images that you see in front of you are downscaled by uh, a large factor. So they're 224 by 224. And even with such a downscale, it is still not possible to determine the exact image that was used during the training. And this is why we call this attack the most destructive one, because it allows you to, to get the exact training data, but also the most fragile one, because it requires a large number of assumptions to hold for this attack to take place. So we discussed the attacks. We saw how bad they can get. How do we actually mitigate them? Well, that depends, is the answer. It depends on what the Federation wants to preserve first, the privacy or the utility. The reason for that is when we try to preserve privacy, we could use components such as secure multi-party computation, homomorphic encryption, differential privacy, and others, but they all have an adversarial effect on the accuracy of the end model. However, when we try to preserve the accuracy of the end model, we could do so at the expense of privacy because we could run a continuous utility function to measure the individual contribution of each client in a collaborator learning setting. As you can see by design, there are issues with trying to prevent both from being attacked. If you concentrate on privacy, you almost always end up losing the utility. However, if you concentrate too much in the utility, you could accidentally leak too much data and open a large number of reconstruction and inference attacks that we've just discussed for the adversary. So the main conclusion of this project is that there is no simple solution to the problem of collaborative machine learning when it comes to preservation of privacy and utility of the model. However, we discussed a very large number of factors that contribute towards a successful or a less successful attack. That includes how the network is composed, how deep the network is, what data do you use, the dimensions of the data, how you deal with client dropouts, and many other factors. And what I want you to take from this slide is that the number of factors that actually contribute to the success or failure of an individual attack is large. And there was always a massive room for research in this area trying to determine, does this specific thing actually influence the attack accuracy? Maybe it does. You should be the one to tell me next time. Thanks a lot for listening. Um, that is it from me.